you'll please go ahead and take your seats. We're going to get started in just about 15 to 30 seconds. All right. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Um, obviously, this is uh, uh, going to be a crowd of quantity. Uh, and by quantity, I mean quality. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Um, if you are here to talk about climate, you are in the right place. Today we're talking about climate and clean cooking, and I have a spectacular panel here that I'll be introducing in just a second. Um, maybe just the, the first thing for me to just check very quickly. For those in the back, can you all just nod if you can hear us okay? Okay, excellent. I'm seeing thumbs up from the back. Thank you all so much. Um, so. Without any further ado, let's go ahead and jump in. So it falls to me to, to frame this session before we start getting into the excellent contributions of our panelists. So in terms of what you heard in the plenary and in terms of what you've been hearing throughout these two days at the Clean Cooking Forum is that climate is a critical benefit of clean cooking. And clean cooking is a tremendous climate solution. And that's what we're going to be diving into today and also talking about some of the ways in which national governments and non-state actors are accelerating clean cooking action to drive climate goals. Uh, I will, just if you'll humor me, repeat some of the stats you will have already heard about the impact of clean cooking on the climate. First, we know that clean cooking uh, the lack of it, rather, cooking with polluting fuels contributes approximately a gigaton of carbon dioxide equivalent every year. And that's roughly 2% of global emissions. So we get an idea of just what a major contributor this is to global warming overall. We also know that clean cooking is the single largest controllable source of black carbon, which is a powerful short-lived climate pollutant second only to methane in terms of its negative impact on the environment. We also know that the lack of clean cooking drives forest degradation. Therefore, destroying and degrading valuable carbon sinks in many contexts, um, and also decreasing all of the benefits that we associate with forest ecosystems for both the communities that immediately surround them and also the world. Um, so I think I won't say any more on that, just that in thinking about, for those of you who may have stayed in this breakout room throughout the day, this has been focused on the co-benefits, whether it's for gender, for health, and now we come to climate. Think about how we can use all of these benefits of clean cooking to unlock the political will for action, the finance for action, and the support for action that we need to expand clean cooking access and obtain all of the benefits that comes with it. So, with that, I get to move into the really good stuff, which is, of course, our distinguished panel here. Um, first up, I have the pleasure um, of introducing Ms. Mr. Frederick Amariati. He is the Monitoring and Evaluation Advisor working with GIZ Kenya to implement a GCF-funded cooking project that's titled Promotion of Climate-Friendly Cooking in Kenya. This is a large project, and we're thrilled to have him uh, talking about it today. Uh, previously, Frederick has had um, a role as an uh, implementing results-based financing project for solar and cooking subsectors, and he's also conducted other market assessments uh, in the off-grid sector. So, Frederick, thank you for being here. Um, next, I want to introduce Justina Kumu. She is the Senior Energy Officer with the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development for the Government of Uganda. And at the ministry, she has spent the last 10 years developing policy and programs on renewable energy and clean cooking. Justine also serves as the lead for greenhouse gas reporting in Uganda's energy sector, and she's been involved in the design of several programs that translate clean cooking initiatives into climate goals. So in terms of what we're discussing here today, um, I can hardly think of anyone better to weigh in on that. And last but certainly not least, we have Sandra Cavalieri whose bio I'm going to pull up so I don't mess anything up. Sandra is the coordinator for sector hubs at the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, or CCAC Secretariat, and that's hosted by the United Nations Environment Program. She coordinates CCAC state partner and non-state partner work to mitigate black carbon and methane from the household energy sector, as well as many other sectors. Sandra has been a tireless advocate for household energy and clean cooking action, so we're very thrilled to have her on the panel here today.
So my first question is for Sandra. Um, Sandra, we heard some talk in the opening plenary about how countries are beginning, and not even beginning, they have. They already have included clean cooking and household energy targets in their nationally determined contributions. In the goals that they set out as part of the Paris Agreement, in terms of what their commitment will be to averting catastrophic climate change. So many countries, national governments have already recognized the importance of clean cooking in the climate fight. Sandra, you know this topic very well, so I wanted to ask if you would just set the landscape for us. Tell us, what do we see in these NDCs, um, and what kind of ambitious action are we seeing at the government level on this? Yeah, so thanks, Forrest, and thanks for inviting me to be on this panel today. It's a pleasure. Um, I want to say that I think that we can be very inspired by all of the work that has already been done by governments. So there's nearly 70 countries that have already included clean cooking or household energy targets in their NDCs. And this really is going to open up an entire world of implementation and action, uh, not only for household energy, but also for the co-benefits of climate, health, gender, and to achieve all of the SDGs. And so it's now it seems like the, the, the work isn't really in convincing governments, but it's in collaboration. It's working together better among organizations and also in countries and sharing among countries so that we can work really quickly to scale up the, the, the cleanest um, fuels and technologies available in each particular context. Um, and just to be more specific, I would say the, the, the ones that kind of pop into my mind are Colombia has a, a target that where they've already identified that they want to dis disseminate one million improved biomass stoves by 2030. So you have a very concrete number. Um, in Rwanda, uh, they, they have a very concrete goal to disseminate um, modern efficient cook stoves to 80% of their rural population and 50% of the urban population by um, 2030. Ghana also has very um, clear targets set in their in their indices, and I, I won't give away Uganda's, but Uganda's is, is especially charming. So I will I will just um, leave with that. But um, yeah, thanks, Forrest. Thank you so much, Sandra, for giving us an idea of what some of those targets look like. The level of specificity that some governments have included in terms of those NDCs. And that level of specificity and also the ambition of those targets is going to be critical to driving clean cooking action and therefore significant climate process. So with that, Sandra very nicely teed me up for a segue, uh, pivoting over to Justine, who of course, as I said, knows this topic so well um, as she is one of the key people in her government working on this. So Justine, first I wanted to just ask you, why is it that Uganda has chosen to prioritize clean cooking in your NDC? Uh, thanks, Forrest, for that question. Um, the use of firewood uh, is very common in Uganda, and it's a similar situation across all sub-Saharan countries, African countries. Uh, we rely mostly on um, firewood and charcoal to meet our cooking needs, and it accounts for 90% of our energy in our whole energy balance. The use of firewood and charcoal, unfortunately, is associated with the negative health benefits. Uh, in some cases, has been the source of you know, gender-based violence amongst women and children. Henceforth, our government came up with very strong targets in our third national development plan to increase access to clean cooking from the current 15% to 50% by 2025, and also to reduce um, the use of firewood and charcoal within the, you know, the clean, in the, sh in the energy sector. And um, realizing the benefits of clean cooking, we have prioritized uh, clean cooking in our, th uh, our nationally uh, determined contributions. So um, they feature in uh, our mitigation actions, which feature in the energy, waste, and um, agriculture sector, as well as the adaptation sector, realizing the core benefits in terms of income generation and um, you know, improved gender, gender you know, situations for the country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justine. And I always have relished the opportunities when I've been able to hear Justine speak about this in the past as 
I often just wish I could record it and bottle it so I don't have to uh, say it because I can never do it as convincingly as she can, is this idea of, one, um, the fact that the lack of clean cooking was such a major driver of emissions in Uganda, which they found by looking at the data. So first of all, the data just spoke for itself in that way. Um, in the other regard, I would say, is that it's a way to advance so many sustainable development goals at one time, as she was alluding to, whether it's gender or livelihoods or health or climate. So by including a goal like that in your NDC, something that touches so many different of the outcomes that we care about, you can enjoy all those benefits at once. Um, so we've been talking a lot um, about our progress so far, uh, the great work that has been done, and now we're gonna pivot a little bit to um, the other side of things and move on to challenges uh, after we've just heard about how great clean cooking action is, how so many governments have committed to clean cooking action, but let's talk about actually getting it done. Um, so Justine is our, uh, our government representative on the panel. I'm gonna come back to you one more time. What are some of the major challenges that you see in Uganda in terms of achieving those clean cooking goals that are outlined in your NDC? Um, the first major challenge is access to finance. We don't have enough money. And in the past, the priority has been on electrification. You know, um, now we are, t we are hearing about clean cooking, but it's taken us more than 20 years to get government to commit to financing and prioritizing uh, clean cooking technologies. But also, clean cooking technologies are emerging. So in the past, you know, then you couldn't talk about e-cooking. And um, then there was also the aspect of quality. So we've worked a lot on developing national standards that have actually been led by, you know, the Clean Cooking Alliance. And we've domesticated this, um, the standards. But there is a big need for awareness creation and, you know, for... You know, for, for government also to realize that clean cooking is not only an energy solution, but it should also be advanced in the agriculture sector and in the waste sector, and also in the gender aspect. So hence the need for massive awareness creation so that not only governments, but even the public can know the benefits associated um, with clean cooking. Thank you. And if we think about some of those challenges, we can look to those organizations and those actors that are working to address those challenges. And so now I want to turn to Frederick um, to hear a little bit more about the project that Indev is supporting in Kenya and his work with it. And in particular, Frederick, as we listen to some of those challenges that Justine just laid out for us, what is the role that supporting organizations like Indev can play in helping countries overcome those challenges. Over to you. Okay, thank you, Robin. Um, I think most of, most of us here know when they're here in dev, they're used to energizing development. I think we evolved a bit. It's now energizing change. And uh, I think as a, as a, a partnership, our role is to try and support the countries we work in to access modern energy solutions which we look at it as a major prerequisite issues around social and economic development. And um, how we do our things, we try to focus more on the value chain or the supply chain in any country. So looking at from the supply side to the demand side. Supply, we're looking at how do we get the cooking solutions into the market, issues around market access to market finance. But on the demand side, which is more interesting and government falls in issues around um, awareness raising on the advantages of using clean cooking solutions, but also more important issues of enabling environment. And um, I think the way we work, uh, Robin, is I think what gives us or makes us uh, is what contributes an advantage to us. It was like we don't go into a country and simply say do A, B, C, D, you know. We walk into a country or wherever we are in the 20 plus countries that we are working in we take the bottom approach, approach. We sit together with all the government players and the other players in the sector. We talk about the issues in the value chain, analyze them and see what are the potential areas of support. And that's how we look at it. And one advantage with some of the partnerships like Endev is um, we've been here for a while. That's the honest truth. Almost uh, since 2005, we've been here. We provide a good solace for most donors, a place to pool resources to get them into now countries like uh, Uganda and Kenya to support some of these things. We have uh, models that are tried and tested 
on how best to approach some of the issues that are happening with these countries. And so the things that, um, the, if they are leveraged on, we are able to achieve much more. But I think I'm trying to move into some example. And what Endeavor has been doing in most of these countries, we've done a couple of things. And where we are, we're at a point where we are ready to scale up some of the activities. We've been working and doing a lot of things on technologies, ETC. And now the next stage is on real like scaling up. And this now fits into what the GCF is coming to support a country like Kenya and Senegal. Uh, in our activities, we're now implementing the promotion of climate friendly cooking. And there are two ideas behind the whole project. One is the potential of cook stoves to contribute to NDC contributions, the obligations we have as a country, which is a major thing that the GCF looks at in one way, but also we're looking to ensure that more households adopt clean cooking solutions you know, at household level. So how governments or how we work with governments is we design such an intervention together, focusing on these key areas. And then in terms of implementation, we still bring the government and other players on board, specifically for issues around ownership. We have a couple of strategies we've developed under the GCF project, and we're looking to see even long after NDEV is gone, will this still be owned, will they still be implemented, or what will happen after we are gone? So from our side, I would say NDEV has this experience base that anyone else can play or leverage on to ensure that now what the countries like Kenya, Uganda, and Senegal are doing easily achieve their goals. Yeah. Thank you, Frederick. Um, first of all, I was thrilled to hear, um, as Justine said, the single biggest barrier is finance, and that was the first thing that Frederick was talking about in his response. Um, I think the other thing that stuck out to me was this idea of, of co-creation between the partner and the government, that it's not going to be this top-down, it's going to be truly um, a conversation in terms of what the shared goals are and how to get there. Um, Sandra, I, I do want to turn to you just, uh, again, not... Um, uh, necessarily a question you were you were ready to be asked, um, but just <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, uh, just as uh, Frederick told us some of the ways in which a supporting partner like Indev can help countries overcome some of the barriers like those that Justine mentioned. Is there anything you would add to that? Anything from CCAC in particular, or just any other organizations in the space that you'd want to call out now? Um, yes. You surprised me because I was expecting a question similar to that. Good. Um, so, yes, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition does now have um, an increased budget for 2022 and 2023. And so we're really pleased to let countries that are CCC partners know that they can request support for scaling up household energy um, projects and also to support development of national plans for clean cooking. And so this is actually a, a process between the CCAC country and the CCAC secretariat. And so if you're from a country and you're not sure if you're a member of the CCAC, you can um, ask me or look at the website. And um, th each country has a focal point, and the focal point in your country is going around to different ministries to collect um, needs and ideas from all of the different sectors. And I think Justine was bringing up a really good point before that um, solutions in one sector often are also beneficial in other sectors. And so if we look at like a solution like biogas, here you're gonna have also tremendous benefits for methane mitigation uh, from your waste sector, from your agriculture sector, and maybe even your transportation sector. And so looking at like the holistic picture is also important. So yeah, that's for CCAC funding, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Sandra. And now we're gonna pivot to a challenge that's been alluded at, but maybe not said explicitly, and that is MRV. And maybe for those of you who don't um, eat, sleep, and breathe, uh, that as some of us do in this room, that's measurement, reporting, and verification. And one of the reasons that it's something that we really want to make sure we touch on today is in many cases it's key to unlocking finance, is you have to be able to demonstrate the results of your work and the benefits of your work uh, to be able to lock into different sources of funding, let's say climate finance. Um, another aspect of MRV that is extremely important is to ensure 
that the goals of your program are actually being realized. Um, so just to, uh, towards the end of this session, we'll take some time to talk about the work that the Clean Cooking Alliance, along with other partners, is doing to support countries with MRV. But before we go on to that, I would just kind of like to get a sense of uh, what Uganda is doing in terms of MRV. So Justine, with that, I'll, I'll turn to you. In Uganda currently, how are you tracking progress in your country on clean cooking? And then once I have your response on that, I'll ask you a follow-up if that's okay. okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so we, in order to translate our clean cooking you know, results into climate results, um, we have had a partnership with our Ministry of Water and Environment. Uh, we have an MOU with them, and as well as a data sharing protocol to improve a transfer of data and continuous, you know, reporting. Um, we have also, uh, we, we also have, we, we participate in the greenhouse gas inventory by providing data from the energy sector. Um, however, we are now looking at, you know, establishing an MRV system for the energy sector and also clean cooking, uh, you know, having a special one for the clean cooking sector so that even the, um, you know, the, uh, the clean cooking projects can be reported in form of climate you know, reporting uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions to mention but a few. And we're also improving, you know, the quality of our data and, and the frequency of data uh, in order to improve the reporting of our, um, you know, clean cooking um, uh, targets. Thanks. And now that promised follow-up is, is coming at you. So um, it sounds like a lot of really meaningful progress has been made already in terms of the way that you're tracking your progress. Um, but if I'm hearing you correctly, it also sounds like challenges do remain. There's more work to be done and there's ways in which your MRV systems can be improved. So with that, I wanted to ask you, what resources do you need to continue to build and scale up the MRV practices you already have in place? Uh, an MRV system is as good as the data it is um, that is input into it and data is our biggest prog problem we are actually reporting at the tier one level and um, the quality of our data is still wanting we can't it's uh, we can't disaggregate it henceforth um, the first you know support that would receive would actually request for is um, in terms of improving the quality of our data the frequency of data collection and also capacity because from the energy sector our priority is energy reporting now translating this into climate goals we need technical capacity and mainstreaming of climate change within the energy sector um, yeah so those are the main issues thanks thank you justine frederick over to you yeah i think this is a very interesting topic especially for kenya and what you're doing under the gcf project one thing we recognize is the Minister of Energy is, plays the role of the sector coordinator for reporting to NDCs. That's always the starting point for us. Number two, there have been efforts to develop a national MRV system. And so far, there is one in place, that it, but it's yet to be taken up and be in use actively. But again, I think what we're looking at is, um, we're looking at this kind of setup, Robin. Uh, we're looking at a national MRV system but then what happens is all other subsectors should come up with their own MRV subsystems that can collect data and easily feed into the national MRV system. So that's the structure we're looking at from the Kenyan side. And what the GCF project now is doing is we are focusing more on building the capacity of the Minister of Energy, our line ministry, to now have these small systems that easily collect data like... Uh, like it's being indicated here. And once we have this data, we analyze it at our level, but easily feed it into the national uh, MRV system that now calculates on what is the role of, for example, the cooking sector towards the NDC or national obligations. So, and I agree, I think um, one of the things we realize and we're trying to bridge that gap from the Kenyan side is the Minister of Energy, you realize issues of funding are really real. Um, coming up with this system requires a lot of technical capacity, which most of the time may not be there, but I think we're trying to cover that for the Minister of Energy again. Uh, we have issues of sustainability. Just We want to make sure when we do this, it's not something that lays their dormant like many other systems have done, so it can still be updated over and over again. Yeah. 
Frederick, I'm very glad you did chime in, and thank you for, for talking about the work that's being done in Kenya related to MRV. Um, and already it seems like some sharing and lessons learned that can be communicated between different countries that are uh, sharing this priority and also working to overcome the challenges of what is often a costly, time-consuming, and long process, but an essential one nonetheless. Um, so Sandra, I'm going to uh, turn to you for perhaps some heavy lifting, um, which I hope is okay. I alluded to the idea of what CCA and some of its partners are doing to support national governments, both in terms of using clean cooking to achieve their climate goals, but also in terms of measuring and reporting against um, those goals themselves. I do just want to name the partners um, in that group. It's called the Clean Cooking and Climate Consortium. We go by the abbreviation 4C, as uh, the full name is a, a bit of a mouthful. And the partners in that are the Clean Cooking Alliance, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the UNFCCC, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, and also Berkeley Air Monitoring Group. We have many of those uh, terrific partners in the room here today. Um, and um, I think we all come together with the desire and the belief that national action on clean cooking is the main way that we're going to see progress and move the needle. And it's also a way that we're going to de deliver definitive climate wins as well. So, Sandra, we've been talking about MRV. I wanted to turn to you to speak about both what CCAC can provide in terms of support to countries for MRV, but also some of the work that 4C has done in that area. Yeah, okay, so thanks, Forrest, and I'm glad I get an opportunity to share that we are supporting countries to um, improve their data collection. So right now we're working with Nigeria also on a national MRV program and, and um, putting short-lived climate pollutants into the, to that national framework. And um, there's also a lot of work going on to increase the data collection for uh, the, the tier in inventories for agriculture and for transportation. And so I would encourage you, Justine, to ask for support to move from tier one to the next tier for the, the data collection from the, from the energy sector. And um, with that, I also would like to invite other countries to request that support. And you can see what other countries are receiving. Um, it's all in one place on our website so that you can kind of food for thought for what you might um, be interested in requesting support for. And by support, I mean money, funding. So, um, so with that, I'll just say the, the 4C group has um, been working to develop guidance materials and kind of a standard set of materials that would hopefully be applicable um, at, at least at a high level in, in most countries. And so we have um, one is a um, framework for clean cooking for MRV and, and um, this is within the, the context of the Paris Agreement and the NDCs that we've been uh, discussing. And we also have a roadmap for national clean cooking programs to achieve emission reductions targets that is available um, for people to use, to bring back to your country and to think about um, if you don't already have a national clean cooking program, what one might look like. And if you do have one, what kind of elements you might want to add to it. Um, as we've seen, a kind of a best practice or marker for success is when a country has a clean cooking plan. Uh, probably it's the same for all of us, even if you just wake up in the morning and have a plan for the day. Uh, the plan is the first step. And then moving through that plan and bringing in the partners to help implement the plan and actually achieve those targets. So these guidance documents have been developed by um, Berkeley Air Monitoring Group and the Clean Cooking Alliance and are, we find to be um, hopefully very useful and um, I'm pushing for a COP launch. So if you're at COP, um, there will hopefully be a, a special launch. Um, and I did already mention the funding windows from the CCAC, but if anybody has questions about that, you can also ask me afterwards. Well, thank you, Sandra. Um, and I'm glad you labeled money. Um, that uh, it's No need to, to use uh, other fancy words for it, um, because that's often what success comes down to in terms of what we're talking about here and in terms of uh, delivering the outcomes that we care about. Um, so while we're on that, um, Sandra mentioned the different resources and funding windows available from CCAC right now. So Frederick, I wanted to turn to you um, as obviously 
GCF is a massive funder in the space. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what is the future funding potential for countries through the GCF? And if you would feel comfortable, would you speculate a little bit on what is the scale of the finance available for work like this? Okay, thank you, Robin. It's a hard one to say, it's putting me in GCF's shoes. I'll try to run away from those shoes. But <laughs> what I would say is, if we look at where we are now, it's 2022 now, it's about eight years to 2030. Most countries committed to achieve universal access to modern energy solutions by 2030. What this means is we are eight years into time and um, we're still talking about resources, money to do A, B, C, D. I think what I would project as a person is in the next few years, the demand for more climate finance is likely to grow. Okay, it's already growing. We project to grow even more as we work towards meeting our 2030 obligations. And uh, what I see happening is with the GCF now opening up even more, we're likely to see an increase in the demand for some facilities from GCF. So if I was to give a yes or no answer on whether there's potential, yes, I see there is a lot of it. But also just beyond the GCF, I think there are other instruments that are now making a comeback. We used to talk about the carbon markets. I think at some point it was there, they say it's collapsed, now it's back again. And whether it's a voluntary or the compulsory instruments, these are also really coming up. And if you look at the sessions we've had since morning, this has been coming out from both sides. But again, I think Robin, one of some of the issues we need to discuss soberly around some of these instruments like the voluntary carbon markets is, what effect are they having on the market, you know? Look at GCF now, like we're spending almost 57 million euros in Kenya and Senegal to develop or to grow the capacity of the local entrepreneurs, the local value chains, to ensure they're sustained in the long run. But I think what's happening in some areas with the carbon markets is we still get the same stoves sold, okay, purchased from these guys and then sold back in the same market at a much lower price. You know, the question here is, what are we do doing to the rest of the market? You know, with more or less, there's a lot of distortion going on, and these are discussions now we might want to discuss maybe going forward. This may, it may not, we may not do it now, but these are things people need to start thinking about. It's a good opportunity on issues around climate finance, but again, is there a way we can not really say regulate it, but is there a way we can design it in a way that it doesn't water down or reverse the gains made in the, towards uh, market development? Yeah. And maybe you asked a question on uh, just a second one, and um, the scale of resources available for cooking. I, had a, I did a quick search yesterday and allow me to check on something quickly. On the GCF website, if you go there, there are so many projects that are running and uh, you realize that a good number are in the solar sector and other cross-cutting areas. But if you look at the ones we've done on cooking now, I think there are about three that are live and currently happening and I would mention them quickly. There's a global clean cooking program in Bangladesh as a whooping 40 million euros. There's now what's happening in Kenya and Senegal, 57 million euros. And then there's one happening in, um, I can't remember where, but it's mitigating greenhouse gas emissions through modern, efficient, and climate friendly cooking, cooking solutions, about 49.2 million euros. Robin, what I see here is look at the volumes of funding available to these single projects, you know. So, what I would say is these are good examples that are working, financing from the GCF, you know. And what I see from this is, it's a positive trend. Looks like there's more money that's likely to go towards clean cooking initiatives. And I think what I would say to everyone listening would be, why don't we look at this as an opportunity or a possible financing avenue for clean cooking inventions? The only thing I would mention is, the GCF has its own requirements. You might want to think about the investment criteria, see how you fit in it. You might want to sometimes go through its processes could, sometimes they could be long, but yeah, these are things you need to be aware of as you start going through this. So more directly, I think there's potential for funding from GCF to us clean cooking. To the scale of funding available, I think they are in a good position to stay. But from the trends we see and what has happened so far for the three, I think there's a possibility there's good money for that. All right. Frederick, I know you said you're going to run away from GCF shoes, but um, thank you for that response. And, um, uh, I think you did a, a really nice job of, of characterizing uh, 
where we are, some examples of really positive trends and also what that could mean for the future. Obviously, um, you've probably heard throughout the sessions of today and yesterday is that funding is a huge challenge for clean cooking. We want to make sure that the trajectory of that is going up, um, that it's meeting the scale of the issue, and part of that is connecting the different actors, be they country governments or someone else, with those funding resources to make sure that it can translate into clean cooking access on the ground. Um, I think maybe Sandra, just one thing I, I wanted to talk a little bit more about in terms of our um, 4C work, um, the work of the Clean Cooking and Climate Consortium was the expert consultations that we've done a little bit. Um, just because one of those was dealing with funding and I think it's a nice segue to what Frederick just shared with us. Uh, one of the, the most central comments that we heard from the governments that we work with is funding's an obstacle, can you connect us to resources? So we brought some of, uh, I think about five or six of the biggest players in the field to provide a how-to guide on how to get funding from them. So that was just uh, another aspect of, of what this consortium is doing. In addition to those guidance documents that Sandra laid out very nicely, we also offer these expert consultations which are meant to provide technical support to the government officials who are implementing those clean cooking goals outlined in their NDCs or elsewhere in their national plans. Um, so I am in the extremely enviable position of running a little bit ahead schedule. Um, so I am going to um, uh, roll the dice a little bit and take uh, questions from the audience. And then uh, before that, we will make sure to provide, I will be taking one question from the audience. Um, thank you so much to my handlers up front. Um, and uh, to, the, to the person who shot up their hand first, you will certainly be getting the mic. Do we have a runner with a mic? Thank you so much. Um. Sorry, if you would please share your name and the organization you're with. Uh, yes, um, Mercy Rose, Energy for Impact. Um, thank you so much for this session. I, I just, I've learned so much so far regarding um, NDCs, MRVs, all these words flying around, but <laughs> it's great to learn more about them. Uh, my question maybe uh, perhaps goes to Justine, but anyone here else, please feel free to respond, is to what extent um, that the government is interacting with other ongoing initiatives or um, clean cooking initiatives within the country to support with data um, collection and of course reporting um, I'm glad to see that the ministries are uh, engaging because sometimes it can be a bit of a, um, an issue, you know, uh, the, the national determined um, contributions oftentimes lie within the uh, jurisdiction of the Ministry of Environment and then now we're having the Ministry of Energy, but I'm glad to see that Uganda, uh, in Uganda it's interactive, but I just want to understand whether that interaction is also um, going to other non-government or, you know, initiatives in the country as well. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, with the new uh, rules of the Paris Agreement, we see that governments are more involved in the reporting of data uh, regarding greenhouse gas emission reductions. Um, that is done by government organizations, but also, you know, private companies. And we're seeing a stronger role in that governments are playing compared to, you know, the CDM and other, you know, engagements of, um, you know, in the climate change space. So um, with the MRV system, it, it will actually improve uh, reporting on what, you know, other private companies and other projects are doing. Um, and also it's going to strengthen, um, you know, data collection from the grassroots, uh, from the local government to actually improve our reporting and, um, you know, and, uh, you know, for instance, um, we, have, we have data that shows that access to clean cooking is 2%, um, you know, clean fuels is 2%. So hopefully with improved uh, reporting and data gathering, you might find that rather than reporting 2%, it should actually be 10%. So with these systems, it will actually improve reporting, you know, for both what the private sector and development companies are doing, but also what government is doing. Thank you. Yeah, I think talking of interaction between partners and government for the Kenyan case, yes, that's more than clearly happening. And I'm glad you said you're from Energy for Impact. is one of our partners through the GCF project. One of the things that we're doing on the side with the Minister of Energy is 
the MRV system, subsystem we are developing for the clean cooking sector actually. All the partners are part of the working group that is giving input into how this should look like. So there are very clear interactions happening, number one. Number two, you realize the government can't do this on its own. And there's a goodwill from the other partners, be they our, our likes or other private sector players, would also like to see this in place to ensure that there's transparency within what's happening in the sector. So to respond directly, yes, there are very good interactions going on. Sandra. Yeah, I'd just like to add that I think that it's true that we really recognize Ministry of Energy um, sitting here, and there are a lot of efforts and really successful examples right now of ministries coming together through inter-ministerial uh, working groups on short-lived climate pollutants that have been organized um, through a, a pretty extensive national planning process led by the CCAC for the last um, decade, um, really with the Stockholm Environment Institute. And I also want to um, recognize the HEPA platform, which is the ministries of energy and environment, I mean, ministries of energy and health primarily, and then hopefully bringing in ministries of environment and other ministries and other sectoral ministries to really start to tackle, um, you know, the problem of household energy more broadly. Thank you so much for your question, which I think transitioned us very nicely into our closing. So we've been talking about the importance of funding. Let's imagine we're in a wonderful world where the funding is there. Uh, we don't have to worry about it and we don't have to acquire it. If the funding were available, what would it take for us to achieve these clean cooking and climate goals? I'll ask each of our speakers to take just about a minute to respond to that. Uh, if we could start with Frederick, then Justine, and close with Sandra. I think for me, I'll look at two things. One, I would still say we go back to the basics. Why don't we develop the national clean cooking strategies for the countries that do not have, finalize on those that are under development, and three, review for those that exist, but do not fit in the current market dynamics. For me, that would be one. The second one would be and the second lady of Ghana gives a very good example. Cooking should be looked at also as a political issue. Why don't we find national champions in the likes of the second lady of Ghana spearheading these initiatives, the clean cooking agenda in these countries? What we do from our end is we have, we resource this office in a way that it's able to play this role. And I always give this simple example for the Kenyan side. The former first lady had this campaign beyond zero. The fact that she was there, that campaign was very well resourced and was able to do a lot. So why don't we adopt that model and have clean cooking champions at national level? Thank you. Yeah, I think um, my submission is um, you'd, uh, you'd need improved coordination, one between um, ministries involved um, you know, in the health sector and um, environment and energy to improve clean cooking planning. And, but also coordination, um, you know, all the way to the district local governments to enable them to also plan, include clean cooking, but also improve their, you know, reporting and data collection systems and have a properly functioning, you know, MRV system that is actually working, not just a system on paper, but one with clear roles, uh, one with roles, you know, where the district local governments know what their roles are, they're equipped with a technical capacity and resources, and we have proper systems that can receive the data and report and you know, show how coordination is actually improving the clean cooking uh, sector. Thank you. Yeah, and la last but not least, I'll say that we recently ran a, like a little project to um, speak with all of our partners about what the, this very question of what would you do if you had unlimited amounts of money in, in the sectors of household energy, but also agriculture, waste, fossil fuels, heavy duty vehicles and engines and cooling. And um, I had the privilege of looking at all of the answers and really the big word that came out for me was collaboration. Like people really need to work together. We need to cooperate. And a lot of the answer is there, a lot of the money is even there, but it's that we, we have to like step back from our selfish position, either as our organization or as our country, and find a way to cooperate. 
Thank you so much to all of you. So I want to say to our audience, thank you so much for your attention as we move through what is an extremely rich and complicated topic quite briskly, um, as this room in probably about eight minutes or so will be transformed into a temporary construction space as they uh, recreate the plenary. Um, but I just want to thank you so much um, for your attentiveness, for your questions, um, and most importantly, I want to ask if you would please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.